Hey everyone, welcome back. It's been a little while, but today we are jumping back into looking at Debbie Pearl's absolute mess of a book, Preparing to Be a Help Me. A book about how to get ready to be married and do everything for a man, written by one half of the couple who wrote To Train Up a Child, basically a guide to child abuse. That's a pretty horrific book. If you wanna go see my videos on that, I'll link them down in the description and also on screen now. And if you wanna see the first parts of me reviewing this book in this series, you can, but it's not essential to watching this video at all. All. This is absolutely fine as a standalone piece and I realise I'm still wearing my glasses. I'm not outside, let me take them off now. I gotta look a bit more like me again now. So in the last video reviewing this book, we learned about the three different types of men who exist and how they will each abuse you in various different ways and how you can romanticise this behaviour. I wish I was joking or exaggerating, but I'm not. So today we're going to be jumping into the next part of this video, but before we do, I want to address a very specific bit of criticism I got on the last video about this, because it bothered me. And this next section will be pleasant to hear, I'm going to talk about some personal stuff, but I think it's important for people like this commenter to hear it and understand where I'm coming from, because it explains why I make these videos and why I cover books like this. So this comment said, hmm, sounds like you're all alone. I also read that book meaning this preparing to be a help me book. And I figured out that much of the things she tells us is true. It is our decision to have a good or a bad marriage. I think you are not old enough to see the things in a different way. If it's so bad, what Debbie is telling us, why don't you try that things in your own life? Just criticize the things without trying it first is not a right way. So are you scared? What's the reason to judge a woman who tries to help young women who haven't so much experience in that point. I think it's a very, very, very good book. It helps myself a lot. And no, I am no 16 year old woman who is all alone. I'm 25 years old and I'll be married this year in July. So don't judge if you never tried the things she tells us in her book, thanks. So to this commenter in particular, you think you're old enough at 25 to be getting married and following this advice and for you to refuse to see things in a different way. But at almost 29, I am too young to understand and point out that Debbie is actually ex just excusing abuse in her book. You're old enough to get married, but I'm too young to see it as abuse. So much of what Debbie writes is not very, very, very good advice. It is actually dangerous for women, and I will not apologize for pointing that out. She's not just trying to help young women who don't have much experience. She is putting vulnerable and naive women in more danger than telling them it's their own fault, excusing what happens to them, saying that, you know, if they got hurt, it's absolutely their own fault, and she won't allow them to see that there is a way out or how to find it. Will she, Pickle? No. Do you agree with me? Yes. And do you know how I know this? Do you know how I recognise that what she's talking about is often abuse and how she's just excusing abuse? It's because I was abused, because I have lived through exactly what this commenter is suggesting I try and live through, saying, have I tried these things? Yes. And it messed me up so, so much. I have lived through being told that when a man throws things at me and kicks me and pulls me around and drives dangerously with me in the car, that it's all my fault. It's something I've done. I'm the one who made him angry. I'm the reason for his behavior. I have been told that I made him do it. I've been told that if I was a better girlfriend, he wouldn't need to do these things. If I just allowed him to do whatever he wanted and sleep with whoever he wanted and use me however he wanted, then he wouldn't have to hurt me. He wouldn't need to get so mad at me if I just let him do who he wanted. I have lived through being told that the only reason I'm getting hurt is because I'm upset by his behavior. So I just need to stop being upset and then I won't get hurt anymore. I have absolutely lived through this. And for this commenter to sit there and say, why won't I do it again? And asking, are you scared? I have to say, yes. Yes, I'm incredibly scared. I am petrified. I'm scared for every other person who has to live in a relationship like that and doesn't know that it's not normal and doesn't have a way out. I'm scared that I'm gonna end up in that same position again and maybe this time I'll actually end up dead. Abuse is scary. These kinds of relationships are scary. Even after I finally ended the abusive relationship, I genuinely thought he was going to kill me. He threatened to kill me. I had to get the police involved. I literally have emails and texts and missed calls saved from him on my phone where he told me he was gonna be waiting outside my house and he would kill me if I didn't do exactly what he wanted. So when I see Debbie writing passages like this and worse, these types are known for expecting their wives to wait on them hand and foot. A kingly man does not want his wife involved in any project that prevents her from serving him. If you are blessed 
win the favor of a strong, forceful, bossy man, then it's very important for you to learn to serve with joy. When I see passages like this, and way worse ones that she's written, I'm not just sitting here having a giggle, criticizing it blindly for a little bit of fun. I'm sat here criticizing this and warning other people that this isn't normal, and this isn't okay, and this isn't healthy, because this is what I've lived through. This is why I still have to see a therapist and work through this stuff, because of the damage it caused to me, and I don't want more people to go through the same thing. It's not youth and naivety why I make these videos. Sadly, it's age and experience and a hell of a lot of pain. People say, well, you're not married, so how can you know how bad it is? It's because I didn't need to be married to be abused. And I'm damn lucky that I wasn't married, because if I'd been stuck with him for life and legally attached to him, then I would probably be dead right now. I genuinely believe that. He was and is a dangerous man, and if I can help more people identify when other men are being dangerous and not just brush it off as, oh, men being men, oh, serve your man, oh, just be happy. If I can help more women get out of dangerous situations, if I can help just one woman get out of a dangerous situation, then I'll have done my job, I'll be happy. So, sorry, that was heavy, but honestly, these topics are. So with that in mind, let's carry on reading the rest of the book. And like I say, if you wanna uh, watch the first two videos in this series, I'll leave them popping up on screen throughout the video. They'll be linked in the video description and you can check them out in your own time. But like I say, you don't necessarily need to have watched them to get something out of this, so don't worry about it. Are you okay, gorgeous girl? Can you tell mama's upset? Come here then, come have a cuddle. Good girl, thank you. And you have saved my life so many times, haven't you? You have, and you always look up to me. I love you, gorgeous. I love you so much. I love you so much. Uh, so the next chapter we are going to be looking at is chapter seven and it's titled Knowledge and it actually starts off making a lot of sense which is, you know, refreshing for Debbie. She says, married life is not all romance and passion, maybe 5%. The rest of your time is devoted to the routine of living. There'll be unexpected trials and burdens that will catch you and your sweetie totally by surprise. Whether your family, not to mention your passion, survives life's curveballs depends on knowledge yours. She says most people live their entire lives behind closed doors, figuratively speaking. They look out the window and see other couples living their lives in such satisfaction, but it all seems so distant to them, so hard, so unreachable. Which I think are all pretty fair points to be honest, like, and I agree that sometimes it's hard to know what other people's lives are really like when you're not living it yourself. Everything can look fine and great and wonderful, where in reality they're actually struggling a lot. Sometimes when I'm at my lowest points, I absolutely like overcompensate by trying to make it look like I'm happier on the outside than I am. However, she goes on to ruin her good points as she usually does by going on to describe a typical marriage and I've never read anything quite so pessimistic and depressing def before. It makes me very, very happy I'm not married. A man comes into marriage believing that his wife will be the fulfillment of all his longings all his dreams, all his expectations. After only a few short weeks, he looks into her eyes and finds only dissatisfaction. A wife blames her husband for being a loser sitting in front of the TV or spending his life on some other useless time waster. The husband is frustrated that something is not the way it should be. He sees the disappointment in his wife's eyes and it leaves him powerless to go forward. So he drops into the nearest chair to lose, lose himself in mindless pursuits. And so he stands behind the locked door thinking his youthful dreams were just wishful thinking. Not really possible. He loses hope. Without his vision, she has no vision or she pursues her own vision apart from him. Which, God, this all makes me very, very grateful and single. <sighs> that said, as horrible as this is, um, I do agree with some of the next part. I know, I'm as shocked as you are, but here we are. For most people, it's a simple lack of knowledge that keeps them chained to the floor, daydreaming their lives away one day at a time. Living behind closed doors means always living in expectation, waiting, waiting, never doing anything better with your life. And I do agree with Debbie that I think this can be a huge problem for so many people. Sort of stagnating and just waiting around and always waiting for something to happen to them instead of going out and grabbing it for themselves and making something happen. You know, I, I've seen this over and over again. I saw it in my own parents. It's something I'm very fearful of in my own life. And so to the point that Debbie's making overall, which is like, hey, if you don't have knowledge and be proactive, you'll stagnate and be unhappy. I actually agree with her. So yeah, look at that something you don't see every day, is it? However, as always, Debbie takes it too far. She writes, 
Many girls waste their youth by being entertained with movies or novels, shopping, playing the social game, yakking on the phone, texting, etc. Or just lying around waiting for one of these things to happen. Which is a sentiment that I believe she opened the book with as well. This idea that teenagers and women in their early 20s are literally wasting their lives if they don't do anything other than trying to impress a man and doing Bible stuff. But the key word in this which Debbie is missing is the importance of the word entertained, you know? If you're getting enjoyment out of something, it's really not a waste. It's absolutely okay to do stuff just because you enjoy it, because it entertains you, because it fulfills you, no matter what age you are, you know? And I think I mentioned this in a previous video, but Debbie is always very quick to disparage women who spend their time building up relationships with other women and building up friendship. And like, look at the word she uses, playing the social game, yakking on the phone. What this actually means is that a person is spending time building a strong social network around them, a strong support network around them, people who can be there for her and who she'll be there for. And that's a very, very positive thing in anyone's life, unless you're an abuser. Or one of the first things an abuser will try and do is isolate you from your friends and your family. So every time Debbie dismisses the importance of friendships and family, and relationships outside of marriage, it just screams red flags to me. It encourages women to only seek solace in their husbands. It worries me so much because an isolated woman is more likely to be abused and not recognize it and not be able to escape it. The only time I was finally able to like es escape my abuser and leave the situation was when a friend pointed out to me it was abuse and she was the one who stopped me sticking around and going back. Isolated women are way more vulnerable and way more likely to be hurt. And then Debbie goes on to tell us another story from her life. If you have seen my previous videos, you'll know Debbie told us the story of how she met her husband Michael, how he basically groomed her from her being 13 years old when he was a fully grown man in charge of her church youth group. So I always worry about Debbie's stories because I do end up feeling a lot of pity and concern for her and I don't think she sets the best examples with them. This one is also quite dangerous, but just like very, very odd. So I'll give you an abridged version of her story. She says, the next story is my testimony about how I finally woke up to the extremes of life and how I grabbed hold of hungering for truth and wisdom. It took a big bad angel to get my complete attention. And that's not a metaphor either. It's, <sighs> you'll see. Most people that hear this story think it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. It happened more than 35 years ago. I was a young wife. I lived in a small community of mostly young military couples. One cold morning, the girl directly across the street came up to tell me the military authorities had called her, reminding her that the health department had issued a requirement that babies two and a half months old should start on their vaccinations. Somewhere I'd read that there were problems with these vaccinations, especially for such young babies, but who was I to question the Department of Health? My best friend Carla, who lived next door, also had a two month old son, but when I invited her to ride along, she wasn't interested in getting her baby a shot. Mrs. Soldier Girl, I seriously hate the names that Debbie used to start this book. Mrs. Soldier Girl and I took our babies and stood in the cold in a line outside a small trailer that served as the local health department. Then I wondered, why didn't we take the time to ask questions, demand information or seek out advice? I know the answer. We were young. We believed that everyone else knew better than we did. Until that moment, neither of us had ever been put in a position to know just how terribly a thing can go wrong due to a lack of knowledge. Mrs. Soldier Girl called that evening to ask if my baby had a big red hotspot where the shot was administered. He did. Both of the babies had high fevers. Okay, I'm gonna interject at this point, just gonna throw this out there. This is a completely common and normal thing. Vaccines are designed to make your own immune system kick in, to give you a very, very oversimplified version here. It teaches your body how to recognize and fight a virus on its own. The red spot where the vaccine was administered, simple immune response, as was the fever. What a lot of people don't recognize is that when you get ill, when you contract a virus, a lot of the symptoms that we feel aren't from the virus itself, but from our body responding. A fever is our body raising our temperature to help try and kill off the virus inside of us. So when we have a non-dangerous version of the virus injected into us through a vaccine, our immune system still responds and increases our body temperature, hence the fever. It does make you feel unpleasant for a while, but it's usually completely safe and normal and the symptoms are much milder and don't last anywhere near as long and don't have the same risk of complications as if you were to actually catch the virus for real. 
As I rocked my son trying to soothe him, I began to wonder why Carla had resisted getting her son a shot, and I sincerely wished I'd listened to her when she tried to explain to me what she had read concerning the shots. Finally, the medicine I gave my son caused him to sleep. I awoke sometime in the pre-dawn hours, the blackest part of the night. Other than my newborn son's groans and my husband's light snores, the night was deathly quiet. I couldn't say why, but I lay tense and fearful, waiting for what I knew not. I moved ever so gently to lay my hand on my son's head. It was burning hot. I moved my hand to his tiny chest and heard a strange rasping sound. Profound terror gripped me, causing my whole body to sweat. Then, as if I could see the shadowy figure, I knew that the death angel stood there at the end of the bed. I gave up trying to convince myself that it wasn't real and I began to pray as I've never prayed before. I pulled my baby up tight to my chest, defying the figure at the foot of the bed that dared enter this room. I jerked the covers off mic and shouted, wake up now and pray. The death angel is in this room. Pray for our son. My startled husband sat up confused and alarmed, then he grabbed the covers away from me, mumbling that I'd lost my mind. I jerked his covers off again and smacked him on the back as I screeched, get up and pray for your son. By this time he was awake and truly concerned for my sanity, as I think we would all be if we were woken up by a woman shrieking about death angels, but there you go. He reminded me that I could pray just like he could, so why did I wake him up? Like, like, See, now I think he's the one in the wrong here because basically she's like upset that their son's ill and he's like, well, what do you want me to do about it? But then at the same time, she's screeching about an angel. So I get why he's like, what's wrong with you? Everyone sucks here. But he was my spiritual head and I knew that now's the time for the top command to pray. Thoroughly chilled, he grabbed the covers to lie back down. But this time his normally obedient wife shouted, you will never sleep again until you pray for our son. He reached over me and laid his hand on our son's head. He prayed. As he prayed, I sensed the death angel leave the room. For the first time in several minutes, the constriction in my chest released. I could breathe again. Our baby fell into an exhausted slumber. Suddenly, red and yellow lights darted across our ceiling. I sat up and pushed the curtain open, peering across the street. Then I saw the ambulance. It was parked across the street at Mrs. Soldier Girl's house. I still remember the feeling of profound relief that enveloped me. I still remember the shame that followed. My son was spared, but her son was taken. I watched as a police car arrived. Why police? All night the baby had cried. The young parents had only a couple of nights left together before the soldier was shipped out to war. When they awoke in the morning, the baby was no longer breathing. At first, the poor stricken couple was charged with neglect because the authorities assumed the baby died of cold. Later, it was determined that it was the common three month crib death that had taken the child. No one dared blame the vaccination that our babies had been given the day before. That night changed my life. Never again did I stand in line like a dumb sheep waiting to receive what professionals said I needed. I learned that professionals were people who were just following orders from people whose only goal is to make a book. It is true they might have gone to school for a few extra years and learned a different vocabulary, but they were not my baby's mum. They couldn't make wise decisions for him. Time has strengthened my resolve. The older and more professional I get, the less I respect professionalism as the voice of knowledge and understanding. Now, no matter what the issue before I submitted, I would learn everything I could possibly know for the sake of my children's health and my family's well-being. The door was open. I started to learn, really learn. Genuinely like horrible story that a baby died, but typical anti-vax nonsense here. Obviously, I'm sorry for the couple who lost their child, but there's no proof that vaccines had anything to do with it. I don't trust someone like Debbie Pearl to be open and honest with a story like this. I don't trust her timeline. I don't really like trust that she actually knows what happened to the baby. The fact that they were arrested for neglect is a bit suspicious to me. The fact that like, I don't know, I just feel like if anyone has an agenda here, it's probably her. And nothing in the story actually says to me like definitive proof vaccines killed this child, so I find it very, very hard to believe. I just feel like this whole story is fear-mongering and ill-informed and unnecessary and would ultimately lead to more children being ill and being put in danger. The fact that she's describing medical school as um, just a few extra years where you learn a different vocabulary worries me a lot because she claims she's learned a lot and knows how to care for her babies, but nothing she has written here demonstrates that she has any even basic knowledge about immunology or even just bas basic biology, you know? And I'm just gonna throw this out there because I always get these comments when I even mention like 
immunology or vaccines or anything. I always get the same comments. Last time I spoke about this and it was in the context of Joe Rogan and his misinformation and someone said to me like, and what education do you have on this topic that Joe Rogan doesn't? And I was like, a lot. Despite what a lot of people online seem to think, I do not have a degree in literature. Um, I actually started out studying biomedical science at Warwick, which is one of the best universities in the world. Um, I ended up changing to a different, more varied science degree purely because um, I didn't want to go on to do postgraduate medicine. I decided that wasn't the career path I wanted to go down, so I changed. But I still did that one year of biomedical science and for people who don't know, UK unis are very, very different to American ones. Our courses aren't generally all that varied unless we can do external modules and choose for them to be. So when I say I studied biomedical science, I mean like a full year of nothing but biomedical science. That said, when I changed my degree and I did my BSc in business management, I actually did external modules in neuroscience and psychology and sociology and philosophy and ethics um, and economics. But when I did biomed, it was just purely biomed, just biology modules and chemistry modules. And that was it for a full year. So my core modules included like a really, really intense big 24 cap module on proteins, genes and genetics, agents of infectious disease. One of my optional modules was one called health in the community. So basically all of these covered topics like immunology and vaccines and public health and you know, the basics of genetics and human biology, like in great, 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 great detail. It was pretty intense. So while I'm not going to claim I'm an expert in the topic at all, I'm not a vaccines expert, I'm not a doctor myself, but I have been educated on this stuff to a high level at one of the best universities in the world. And I do know more than your average person. And I do know more than the likes of Joe Rogan and Debbie Pearl. So, you know, it's worth mentioning. Um, and while we're on the topic of misinformation about health problems, Debbie goes on and this whole section makes me angry. Okay. Did you know that down in the Amazon there is a tree frog that has horribly toxic poison on its back? The poison does not appear anywhere else in nature except in the gut of schizophrenics. People with multiple personalities. First up, that's not what schizophrenia is at all. Schizophrenia is a mental health condition which can cause hallucinations or delusions or confusion amongst other symptoms, but it can absolutely be managed by, you know, living a healthy lifestyle and medication and therapy, and it does not at all cause multiple personalities. That is completely wrong. She then says, this poison is not found in the gut of healthy people. Is it found in the gut of any other diseased individual? Thanks to a mum and dad who were desperate to find help for their autistic son, we now know that the same toxin is in the gut of, an aut of autistic kids. Second bit of misinformation here. Neither schizophrenia nor autism are diseases. People can be perfectly healthy while having schizophrenia and autism. I am not diseased because I'm autistic. Right now you are unmarried and autism is not an issue with you. Think again, Daddy. <laughs> but what about two years from now? What are your chances of having an autistic child in two years? Impossible, not gonna happen. Birth control is a thing that I thoroughly understand and like. <laughs> Higher than you think. Once an unknown disease, autism is now destroying the lives of one in every hundred children. Misinformation number three. Autism does not destroy lives. Sure, for many people, it can make life a little different, especially when we're living and working in environments designed for neurotypical people, especially when it goes undiagnosed. But it's not just something that flat out destroys lives in the same way that something like cancer does. Cancer destroys lives, autism doesn't. Autism is not necessarily a bad thing, it just means our brains work a little bit differently and in different ways to other people. And it's not that more people have autism than ever before, the same number of people have autism, it's just now we understand it more so fewer people are going undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. Sure, numbers of diagnoses are higher, but not the number of people with autism. That's still pretty much the same as it's always been. She goes on to ask, what can you do to avoid the chances of your child developing autism? Which annoys the hell out of me. And then she goes on a long rant about how right now you need to learn to do things like learning to cook with beans and fresh vegetables so you can make sure you have a healthy baby and not a diseased autistic baby because now is the time to learn to have healthy babies and what to do if your child has health issues. She then moves on to saying, 
I wish I could avoid the subject of birth control, but it will be the single most discussed subject once you are married. She goes on to claim, certainly no Christian will want to use any method that causes the destruction of the fetus after conception, which is just untrue. Plenty of Christians understand the need for abortion and support it and will even use it themselves. That said, abortion is healthcare, not contraception. Contraception is about preventing pregnancy, not destroying fetuses. It's about preventing the fertilization or implantation of an egg. Jumping straight into this fear-mongering language with destruction of a fetus just screams misinformation to me. For all Debbie talks about birth control and how terrible it is, I'm not sure she could even describe to you what, for example, an IUD is or how it works. I mean, she later goes on to say, don't let some nurse at Planned Parenthood tell you that IUDs are not abortive or that the pill is not a problem. Trained professionals are trained to lie, which is just flat out wrong. There's some major projection here from Debbie because the only person lying is her. The pill, for example, generally stops ovaries from releasing eggs, increases the viscosity of mucus in the uterus, and thins the uterine lining, meaning sperm find it harder to move towards an egg, and even if an egg was fertilized, it would struggle to implant. That's how it prevents preg pregnancy. There's no destroying fetuses. IUDs also stop sperm from fertilizing eggs, and take preventive measures to stop eggs implanting in the uterine lining. Again, no destroying fetuses. Debbie is just flat out incorrect. She says, my, uh, my object here is for you to learn about your body, come to, come to understand the entire process. Absolutely agree with this, perfect. But then it just gets weird. If you don't give it any thought now, then the chances are you'll be pregnant and puking within three weeks of marriage. Your first child will be a girl. Now, how can I know that? Because if you are like most girls, you will plan your wedding for the week after your period ends. This is when most women are fertile. During the first three days of fertility, the woman's slight discharge is beneficial to female sperm. The fourth day, the woman's slight discharge is advantageous to male sperm. Did you know that there are male and female sperm? How do I know all of this stuff? I study. Knowing things helps. Okay. <laughs> So where do I even start with all of this? Because there is a lot. Let's go for a super, super simplified version of everything, right? Okay, so a baby's DNA comes partly from the mother's egg cell, partly from the, farm, uh, the father's sperm cell. We know this. These cells are called gametes, and so they contain half the chromosomes that most cells in the body have. Because of this, each egg cell will only contain one X chromosome, and each sperm cell will only contain one X chromosome, or one Y chromosome, whereas most cells in the body contain two X or an X and a Y. That makes sense? So if the sperm cell contributes an X chromosome, the, the fetus that develops and grows and becomes a baby will be a girl with XX or a female, um, because this is about sex, not gender. And if it contributes a Y, it will be male. All of these ideas that Debbie is talking about come from a man called Landrum B. Shettles, who wrote a book back in the 60s, claiming that depending on whether the sperm was carrying an X or a Y chromosome, it would look and act differently. They'd be different shapes, different sizes, they'd swim faster or slower than the other. And because of all this, by controlling when and how you had sex, he believed you could increase the chance of having a male or female baby because it would increase the chance of which type of sperm cell would fertilize the egg. While in general there's not really much harm in believing this theory and, you know, I guess kind of going along with it if you want, it's not really been proven. There have been studies done in the 90s and the early 2000s that flat out claim he is wrong. Even his ideas about the shapes and behavior of different sperm may just be flat out wrong according to a number of studies. Shettles also encourages women to do stuff which can be incredibly harmful, like douching with white vinegar or baking soda to encourage whichever gender you want. Please, 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 please don't do this. Like, just do not shove these items up your vagina. I can't believe I have to say this. Do not put vinegar in your vagina, please. And like I say, this is where Debbie is getting her knowledge from. This is her studying. So I take everything that she says with not just a grain of salt, but a small mountain of salt. A mountain of salt which you also should not stick up your vagina. Debbie then goes on to talk about how frequent ovulation and periods are our punishment for Eve's sin and the Bible, so that's gross. And then with an utter lack of self-awareness, Debbie claims, as a single girl, you need to decide before marriage if you are willing to cheerfully and confidently go along with your husband's wishes, knowing he may change his mind. He might begin marriage believing in birth control and then change his mind. Never go into marriage thinking you will change his mind. 
that attitude is controlling. So a woman wanting control over her own body is controlling, but a man wanting to control her is to be expected. Another double standard there. And then she goes on to talk a little bit about homeschooling. And there's this like revelation that you actually have to learn stuff yourself to be able to teach your kids, which shocking, I know. <laughs> it's totally ridiculous. Um, and then it's, and then that's where this part of the book ends and that's where I'm gonna end this video. In the next part, we're gonna jump forward a little bit to the section in which Debbie teaches us what kind of women we have to be in order to attract the right sort of man. So that'll be fun. If you'd like to see that, don't forget to subscribe because I post videos as often as I can. Sometimes we review, we review silly books like this and debunk the bad science. Sometimes we cover science and history topics. Sometimes we do poetry and literature analysis and just lots of other fun stuff. Lots of social commentary, lots of atheist stuff, lots of feminist stuff. It's all fun, it's a mixed bag here. But overall, I just try and make education entertaining and hope for the best. <laughs> If you do enjoy the poetry content, stick around because I'm going to be uploading a new poetry video very, very soon. As always, those kind of in-depth reviews take a bit of time, which is why it's taken me a little bit of time to work on this, but I promise you it'll be a good one when it's out. And if you have any guesses of what book it's going to be, it is a YouTuber poetry book, but a good one. So let me know your guesses down in the comments below. And for now, um, thank you for watching and I'll see you again really, really soon for the next part of this series.